Hello, Shiver Seekers. Are you ready to follow us into the unknown? I'm Cynthia. And I'm Stephanie. And you have found the dark oak. Today, we are discussing the incredibly frustrating disappearance of Jennifer Kessie. And when I get to the really frustrating part, you're just going to be so upset right along with me. So stay tuned. Getting ready to get hot. Oh, man. Welcome to The Dark Oak, the mystery podcast with purpose. Each month through the Branch of Hope Fund, we give a portion of earnings from our Patreon and sponsors to a nonprofit organization related to the first two episodes of the month. And the best part is you get to help us decide where that money goes. To find out how you can be a part of the movement, head over to thedarkoak.com or stay with us until the end of the episode and we will give you all of the details. Sylvia, you sound fired up today. Ah, oh, Stephanie, it's this case. Oh, is it? I thought it was my refurbishment and reorganization of our pod lab. Okay. All right. I do have to say the pod lab is pretty <laughs> exciting. Listen, guys, we got new chairs. Yeah, we did. New shelves. Yeah, we did. Like all these little cubbies. I lit a candle today. We have a lavender vanilla candle going right now. I mean. So much ambiance. It's so nice. We're just going to be able to bring you even more episodes now. We may never leave. We may never leave. (laughs) But that's okay. You could be excited about the case too, I suppose. (laughs) Well, here's the thing with this case. You're actually probably pretty familiar with it because it happened right here in Central Florida. Yeah, I do know a little bit about this case. I will tell you, I have not read about it or researched anything about it since it happened. So you're going to give me a little refresher. Well, it probably stressed you out for the same reason I feel close to it because she's our age. Yeah. She She, was basically a contemporary of ours. Yes. I really relate to Jennifer Kessie. She's almost exactly one year older than me. She's probably exactly your age. We both lived in Orlando. Her condo complex is right next to an apartment complex where I lived. The family dynamic is similar. She had two parents and one sibling. Like, I feel like this could have been me. It's very relatable. Very relatable. Yeah, which is triggering. (laughs) Very triggering. And I don't know if you feel the same way, but because we've been looking at her face for almost 20 years now, it almost feels like I know her. Yeah. Because again, you know, this is this is our backyard, folks. For those of you not from the area who may not have heard Jennifer's story, let me just give you a little background on Jennifer. So she was born on May 20th, 1981 in New Jersey, but her family relocated to Florida. Jennifer graduated from Vivian Gaither High School in Tampa, but then moved to the University of Florida in Orlando, where she graduated in 2003 with a degree in finance. You go, girl. Smarty pants. Mm -hmm. She got a job as a finance manager at Central Florida Investments Timeshare Company located in Okoy. Yep. Stephanie knows where that is. It's a smaller little city just outside of Orlando. And Jennifer bought a condominium at the Mosaic at Millennia just three months before she disappeared. So she was doing pretty good for herself. I I had a friend that lived in that apartment complex. Oh, wow. Really? Yeah. Well... It was after Jennifer Cassie's disappearance, but I remember when she told me, and she was from New York, like she had just moved down and she wasn't really familiar. And I was like, should I tell her or not oh, tell her? Wow. Well, that's great. Now that's, that's close to wild. Yeah, yeah, that's wild. I think we can all agree Jennifer was doing pretty well for herself. She was 24 years old, purchasing her own home. She had a great job. I think she's pretty amazing. And it's interesting that you have a friend who lived in this complex because it was actually a really nice neighborhood for those of you who don't know. At this time, the Mall of Millennia, which is like right there where where her complex was. Still, it's it's one of the most premier malls in the country. Yeah, it's Chanel, Burberry, Prada, Hermes, like (laughs) Oh yeah. That's the Mall of Millennia. And this complex is like right across the street from it. So a really nice area. Now, in general, Orlando does have a pretty high crime rate, but this is a nice area in Orlando. Yeah. On top of being very successful, Jennifer was a really just good person. She was very kind. She was really responsible. She enjoyed making wise choices. She was not a reckless 24-year-old, which, you know, is saying a lot because 24 is still that age where you can kind of be a little irresponsible sometimes. But that was not Jennifer's MO at all. For about a year, she'd been dating a man named Rob Allen, and just the week before she went missing, Jennifer and Rob had gone on vacation together to St. Croix in the Virgin Islands. 
Fancy. Very fancy. They came back on a Sunday, but their return trip was delayed because she got in later than she'd planned. She spent the night at Rob's house, which was in Fort Lauderdale. So this was a long distance relationship. I used to live in Fort Lauderdale. So depending on where in the area she lived, this was probably about a three hour drive from Orlando. Sure. She stayed over Sunday night and then got up super early and drove straight to work on Monday, January 23rd, 2006. And despite this relationship being long distance, the two would see each other pretty much every weekend. And I feel like if you're ever going to do that, that age, it doesn't seem like that big of a deal. I lived in Orlando and was dating someone in <laughs> yeah. Fort Lauderdale. And every weekend, one of us was going back and forth to visit the other one. And many times I would get up super early on a Monday morning to drive straight to work. So I... As I was researching this, I was like, oh, I mean, because that stinks no matter how young you are to have to get up at like three in the morning, but sure. But and I drive for three hours. Young love. <laughs> it's what you do. It's what you it's do. It's what you do. Now, as far as we know, Jennifer had a pretty uneventful first day back to work after her vacation with Rob. She called her mom, Joyce, on her way into work that morning so she could give her all of the details of her trip. Yes. And Joyce said that Jennifer was on a cloud. And at some point during the day, Jennifer also called her brother. I don't know at what point, but I know she spoke with her brother that day. She was seen leaving work around 6 p.m. by some of her coworkers. And then she talked to her father, Drew, on the phone while she was driving home. This is a very close-knit family. Yeah. She talked to every one of her immediate every family members. Every member of her family. A very close family. She talked to Rob later that night. And that phone call ended around 10 p.m. Unfortunately, Rob would say this wasn't a great phone call. Uh-oh. The couple had had a little disagreement, and Rob said that the long distance was really taking a toll on their relationship. Oh. And I felt Even that Even after this too. just big vacation? Again, having lived this, I can relate to that, because yeah. sometimes that's what makes it worse. We just had this great time together, and then... And now here I am at my apartment alone. Alone. Yeah. I and get I'm going to have to drive three hours to come see you again. Yeah. So that can last a while, but it does get old. All right. In so many of these cases that we discuss every week, the big thing that first alerts a person's loved one that something is wrong is when what would be considered a typical behavior starts to change, right? Sure. In Jennifer's case, she had a habit of either texting or calling Rob every morning before she left for work. But on this particular morning, which was Tuesday, January 24th, he didn't hear from her. Well, but they had just had a fight. Right. He did try calling her, but he said it went straight to voicemail. But again, they had just, they had, just a had a fight. fight. And so at first, this, this was no big deal. In addition to them having just had a fight, he also remembered that Jennifer had said that she'd had a meeting that morning. He assumed that she was probably just preparing for this meeting. And maybe that was why he didn't hear from her. All logical reasons. Very logical. But Jennifer never made it to that meeting. Yep. And by 11 a.m., when Jennifer never showed up to work at all and it had not called to say that she was running late or not coming in, her coworkers immediately knew that something was wrong. This was a huge red flag because Jennifer was super responsible. This was so out of character. So Jennifer's employer actually called her parents. Okay. That says a lot about her character. It's 11 a.m. and her employer's like, Hold, something's wrong. We're calling we're yeah. calling the parents. Yeah. Drew and Joyce immediately started the two-hour drive from Tampa to Orlando. And during their drive, they called the manager of Jennifer's condominium and asked him to check inside her home with a spare key. The manager did go inside, but from what he could see, everything looked fine. He did notice that her car was not in the parking lot. And when her parents arrived at the condo, they agreed. Everything looked normal. The only thing that seemed to be missing, the only two things that seemed to be missing were Jennifer right. and her car. Okay. And the interior of the condo looked as though Jennifer had a normal morning. There was a wet towel in the bathroom. Okay. As if Jennifer had showered and then dried sure. off. Clothes were laid out as if she'd recently laid out a couple of options for like work outfits. And okay. then whichever one she chose not to wear, she just left. A brand new pair of shoes that she told her mom she was really excited to wear was missing, implying she was probably wearing them. Okay. So it appeared that Jennifer had likely gotten dressed and left to go to work that morning. Drew and Joyce called the police and tried to report Jennifer missing, but Jennifer's an adult. Yeah. 
she's allowed to leave and not tell anyone where she's going. So the police told Drew and Joyce that Jennifer probably just got in a fight with her boyfriend and decided to take a long drive to get away and clear her head. I don't understand why the character of the missing person doesn't come into play here. I get it. There are some people that have a habit of kind of not answering their phone or skipping out, but she's not one of them. I've always thought the character should really come into play because I'm t- if I don't show up tonight, if I don't come home tonight, something is wrong. There's no logical reason why I would just not go home tonight. But if the police were just like, ah, you know, she's probably just really tired of the kids and the husband and stuff. She's probably just on a long drive. Like, meanwhile, I'm out being abducted or something. Well, like- and for some people, I think that might be true. Correct. You know, that you just need hours at a time where you can just kind of get away a little. But if that's not your M.O., then right, let's look further into it. Right. I just I feel like some of these rules are not a one size fits all. Right. Now, I will say that despite them telling Drew and Joyce, hey, she's probably just taking a drive, relax, she'll show back up. They didn't completely ignore the scenario. They did look into it. But I'm assuming maybe an official missing persons report wasn't filed immediately, but they didn't like altogether ignore it. Jennifer's family and friends, they weren't going to let anything stop them. They immediately sprung into action, distributing missing person flyers with Jennifer's photo. They had those flyers out by that evening. And the Orlando Police Department did organize and implement search parties by foot, horseback, boat, helicopter, car, and ATV. So they were looking. Yeah. I got to give them that. Yeah. Yeah. For two days, the Kessie family talked to Jennifer's neighbors to see if anyone saw anything. They continued to try to get Jennifer's face in front of as many people as they could. And on the morning of Thursday, January 26th, a tenant of a nearby apartment complex called the police, saying that there had been a car sitting in front of their apartment for several days. And it looked just like the vehicle of the missing girl that they'd been seeing on the news. Mm. This car was Jennifer's 2006 black Chevy Malibu. Mm. Now, authorities moved quickly to get surveillance images of the parking lot where her car was found. Here's the part that's frustrating. I warned you this case would have some frustrating moments. Yeah. Here's the frustration. The video shows someone pulling into the apartment complex in Jennifer's car, pulling into a spot, then backing out, then pulling back in. Like they were adjusting. Yes. They wanted to be in the spot correctly. And actually in one report, I heard that they backed the car in. So I'm not sure exactly which orientation the car was. Okay. But I know that this person, either way, they were either backing the car in or just adjusting. So they adjusted the car. They adjusted the car one way or another. The person then gets out of the car and starts walking away and they're out of that frame. Okay. So they're out of that view. Another camera picks up this driver. And in this view, the driver is walking on a sidewalk. And between the sidewalk and the camera, there is a tall metal fence that runs parallel with the sidewalk. Oh, my gosh. So the fence is between the camera and the driver. Okay. Yes. This camera, instead of just taking a continuous video, takes a photograph every three seconds. And in every single frame. No. No, no. And every single frame, the driver's face and any other potentially distinguishable features are completely obscured by the iron posts in the fence. Every single frame. They could not have planned it differently. Like this person how got so lucky. Yeah, and I hate to even use the word lucky because they're they don't deserve any luck, but How unfortunate. So frustrating because we do have video, if you want to call it that. But you cannot even tell if this person is a man or a woman. Well, that was going to be my next question. Is there anything distinguishable? All you can really see is that this person appears to Uh be wearing all white. Something that kind of looks like it could potentially be like work coveralls or like a painter's yeah, like a smock like, of some kind. Yeah, but it's yeah. pants and yeah. shirt. It's kind of loose fitting. And it looks kind of like what a painter might wear. Yeah. Or, or something like that. Okay. And it appears to be all white. And then it looks like they're wearing black boots. But I guess potentially they could be dark brown or some other dark color. Because okay, sure. all of the surveillance film is in black and white. Uh, of course it is. Okay. Now, the fact that this person appears to be wearing white 
which again is the absolute most that you can even really take from this video. That's the most helpful thing. But even that is up for debate because the black and white camera, sometimes certain shades of certain colors can look different on black and white. For instance, in researching this case, I found a blog post with photographs of someone wearing bright fuchsia, like bright fuchsia from head to toe. But in the black and white surveillance, it looked like they were wearing all white. So again, we don't even really know what this person was wearing. And again, can't say if they're a man or a woman. We're going to presume a man. The only thing we know is they are a fastidious Parker. That is truly the only thing we know. That's all we know. Now, despite this video not being very helpful at all, the video was shared and all of Jennifer's friends and family were asked to look at it, but no one recognized the driver of Jennifer's car from that video. Of course not. What what can you... I recognize those boots. I mean, you can kind of see the person's, like, gait, I guess. Okay, fair. So, and that's what authorities did ask. They said, don't pay attention to, like, what you think the person's wearing. Try to pay attention to, like, the tiny man. They move. Yeah. Right. But even that's obscured. Yeah. Everything's obscured. Authorities were able to tell from the video that the car was dropped off at this apartment complex around noon on Tuesday. The last time anyone spoke to Jennifer was at 10 p.m. on Monday night. So sometime between 10 p.m. Monday night and noon on Tuesday is when we can assume something happened to Jennifer. Right. So since the police were not able to do too much with this video, they enlisted the help of the FBI. They were called in to take a look and see if maybe they could determine any more about the person captured on this film. And the only thing they were able to determine was that the person stood between 5'3 and 5'5. So that... Okay, that's interesting. If it is a man, which again, if you just showed me the picture, I'd be like, that probably looks more like a man than it does a woman. And this is not Jennifer in the video. It's not Jennifer, no. But... If it is a man, that's not yeah. a tall man. That would be below average height for a man. Right. It's, yeah. Is It may even be below average height for a woman. 5'3 five, to 5'5? Five, five? I mean, I'm five foot, so <laughs> everybody's tall It's not me. Cynthia level. <laughs> um, but yeah, it would definitely be a distinguishing characteristic, I right. think. So it's someone of shorter stature. There were some valuables left in Jennifer's car, such as a DVD player. So robbery as a motive was ruled out. However, some of Jennifer's personal items were missing, such as her cell phone, her iPod, which back in 2006 was a big deal. Yeah. Her keys, her purse, her briefcase, and of course, the clothing that she was wearing. Yeah. Authorities tried to ping her cell phone, but its power remained off and they were unable to do so. Jennifer's bank card has never been used since her disappearance. Now, I think it's interesting that this DVD player was left behind because at the time that would have been a very high value item. Like nowadays, not so much. But at the same time frame, I had somebody break into my car to get one of those portable GPS systems yeah. that like now is so obsolete. Yeah. They broke into my car to steal this because it was considered high value. So to leave a DVD player in the back seat is just strange because, again, that would have been a high ticket item at the time. Again, what that says to me is it really tells us a lot about this person's motive. Sure. And actually, to me, it makes it even scarier because it's not it's not just robbery. Oh, it's totally creepy. And it's and even robbery after the fact. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, like I'm just so satisfied with whatever I just did. I'm not even interested in these valuables. Yeah. Oh, that's terrifying. Right. So terrifying. Creepy. I don't like it. A search dog tracked a scent that led from Jennifer's parked car in the apartment complex where her car was parked. This complex was a mile or two away from Jennifer's condominium complex. So it was close enough that it wasn't super far away, but it also wasn't the same kind of uppity area. It was getting a little less fancy, this particular apartment complex where the car was found. And that's the thing around that area. It is very high-end retail in that area, but not too far away, you really get into some low income areas. Right. So when I lived there, you go past a certain point and like suddenly everything changes. Yeah. So I just knew. And I think every state has one of those areas that it's very, it's very progressive in one area. Mm -hmm. And then you get to some of the older areas and not so progressive. Right. Where her car was found was getting to a little bit more of a tricky area. Sure. A A search dog tracked a scent from Jennifer's parked car in that apartment complex back to Jennifer's condominium complex. Well, oh, now this led investigators to believe that 
the person of interest, and that's what they're calling the person who was seen driving the car. They're not calling them a suspect. Yeah. They're calling them a person of interest. But this led investigators to believe that that person may have returned to Jennifer's condo after parking the car, but there was no other evidence found along this this route. So the, the dogs tracked descent back to Jennifer's complex. Okay, got it. A forensic examination was done of the car, but again, there was very little evidence found. Just one latent print, and a latent print is one that is not visible to the naked eye. And then later, this was not originally reported, but later we would learn there was one small DNA fiber found. A fiber. Mm -hmm. Okay. But originally that information was not released. Okay. Because of the lack of fingerprints and any other evidence, it was determined that the car had been wiped down. The investigation revealed that there were no signs of forced entry or struggle. So initially, investigators thought that Jennifer was probably abducted after she locked her front door sometime between that moment to when she was walking towards her car or maybe even getting into her car. Yeah. So we know that oftentimes when something like this happens, the offender is someone close to the victim, right? right? Obviously, Jennifer's family, her friends, those close to her are going to be looked at. Her boyfriend was questioned, and the police even went as far as to interview an ex-boyfriend of Jennifer's. Oh, that lived in the area? Actually, he didn't. He lived a couple hours away. Okay. But still, they did question him. Yes. So Rob, Jennifer's current boyfriend, he was ruled out very quickly. Okay. This ex-boyfriend, his name was Matt. He was actually a friend of Jennifer's brother, and Matt had recently made it known that he wanted to get back together with Jennifer. Mm. So police wondered if maybe when rejected, he would have had a motive to want to harm her. So I think that's why they wanted to question him is because, you know, they're grasping for straws. They're looking for anybody who might have anything. So the fact that this guy wanted to get back together with her really made him worth talking to. He was questioned several times, but was ultimately ruled out as a suspect. Okay. And when Jennifer disappeared... Jennifer's condo complex was undergoing a pretty significant expansion. This was actually an old apartment building, but it had just recently been made into condos. Okay, got it. That that happened a lot around here. Mm -hmm, It sure did. Because of this, there was expansion and there were a lot of laborers on site, many of whom were not English speaking. And according to some of her friends and family, Jennifer had mentioned that she was tired of some of these workers constantly whistling and catcalling her every time she went like in and out of her house. Yes. <laughs> Which, <laughs> guys, that never worked. <laughs> I mean, I, I literally have in my notes here. Can you imagine having to get cat called every time you walked out of your house in the morning? Uh. Like, <laughs> I mean, if you want my attention, like hand me a cup of coffee and tell me you're taking care of dinner tonight. But whistling and cat calling. Oh, my gosh. Just so annoying. So authorities tried to interview some of these laborers, but unfortunately, due to the language barrier, that was not as productive as they would have liked. You're telling this, me they don't have a okay. Spanish-speaking <laughs> investigator on the Orlando Police Department? Thank you. So here in my notes, I say, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. This makes me feel like the authorities really didn't try questioning these people very much because... What on earth? I, I mean, mean, I will say Spanish is very common here in Orlando. This is... This would not be like a, a rare dialect here. So half of our population is bilingual. Like, <laughs> what, are, what are they talking about? To me, it makes me just feel like they just didn't really think there was anybody worth talking to. Yeah. Now, I will. I will tell you. Um, I watched years ago. This was years ago. I watched the Discovery Channel show Disappeared. Okay. And I watched the episode on this case, and I remember even all these years later, one of the things that they said in that episode is that many of these laborers were undocumented. Right. And that could explain why there wasn't a whole lot of communication. Like maybe when they started seeing authority showing up, they, they stayed away. Yeah. That could explain why maybe um, sure there wasn't a whole lot of communication. Sure. There. But saying that the, the, the language was the barrier I know. is foolish. <laughs> a little bit. A little bit. And, and like, try again. Try again, guys. We need a different excuse. <laughs> we need please. a different excuse. 
So I mentioned the complex was being renovated. Because this complex was so new, Jennifer was the only person living on her floor. Oh, that's kind of scary. It's very scary. Yeah, I don't, I would feel very exposed. Me too, me too. And not only was she the only person living on the second floor of her building, there were actually a whole lot of empty condos like throughout the entire part of the complex. So she was in more of like a new part. And again, this is concerning for several reasons, but one of them means there's a lot less witnesses. Sure. But also there would have been a lot of potential hiding places to hide Jennifer because you think about it, there's all these empty yeah. condos yeah. that many people have access to. These people who are working there have access right. to. Now, one of the rumors that I heard about this case, although I've heard it and read it in enough sources that it's probably more than rumor, but supposedly, allegedly, some of the construction workers were actually allowed to stay in the empty condos while they were doing the construction. Okay. Which, if it's true, is surely convenient. But I would just want to know, like, what kind of background checks are we doing? What kind of paper trail is there? Because if you even go try to rent an apartment, you're going to have to do a background check and things like that. If these people are undocumented or some of them are undocumented, they're not doing background checks. Right. So we don't even know who is coming and going. The fact that they're undocumented doesn't mean they're criminals. However, there's not even a paper trail on who they are so that you can go back and interview them, talk to them, find alibis to see if there might be a rotten egg in the bunch. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. By no means am I saying any of these people are dangerous. It just makes it a lot harder to track. There's no paper trail. There's no paper trail. If you have somebody renting an apartment, you at least you have information on them. And a lot of them could have even been day workers. Mm -hmm. I know that's very common in the construction industry, especially when it's really booming, when you just need hands on deck. And a lot of them, they'll just pick them up for the day. Right. So they're not even regular workers. And they're absolutely could be a bad person. I mean, there's bad people everywhere. So there of absolutely course. could be a dangerous person. And we have no way of knowing. Of course. Who's even there. Yeah. So that and was. It is, scary. it is very, it is very tough among the undocumented workers because they're so hesitant to come and talk to authorities because they're worried about ramifications on, they find themselves in a really tough situation. Even if they want to come forward with some kind of information, their own fear really kind of holds them back. Which is really unfortunate. It's it's really sad because, yeah. yeah, they're really kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. I, I, I absolutely feel like that. Yeah. yeah. And not to go off on this tangent, but I know someone who is trying to get citizenship here. They've been living here for decades. They have a family here. And for them to get American citizenship was so difficult. Yeah. Even despite doing everything by the book. So my heart really goes out to to people who find themselves in that scenario. That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I get you. <laughs> I get it's, it. It's, it's yeah. rough. Yeah. You kind of mentioned the, the idea of living, like being the only person on a floor of an apartment is pretty scary. And I'm with you because one of the things I did like about apartment living was feeling like I was surrounded by people. Mm -hmm. Like if I screamed, somebody would have heard me. Mm -hmm. But knowing she was the only resident on the floor... I think it's safe to say that's probably not the case for Jennifer. Jennifer's condo was in a gated community, but at the time Jennifer went missing, the gate was not operating properly. And one of the reporters who followed this case from day one and was on the scene said that the security, yeah. end quote, quote, in, you know, yeah, in air quotes, exactly. was very loose. People were coming and going. There was yeah. no security. There was yeah. no security. I often find those gated communities, it's like a false sense of security. Sure. You just follow somebody in. I don't know. They're not as safe as you think they are. They're not at all. I mean, the amount of times I've gotten into a gated community, exactly, just by following someone in. Yeah. And if you really want to get in, you're going to get in. If you really want to get in. It keeps honest people out. Yes. Yes. And the it. fact that you and I just admitted that we follow people in, I don't know. It's not saying we're not honest. I'm just saying. <laughs> we just cover enough of these cases that we know what the dishonest people do. That's, That's right. what it is. That's right. <laughs> We are rule breakers. We are savages. We just beat that arm. 
I can't tell you how many times I've wanted to. Like, I don't know if you like get the thoughts where it's just like, what if I just did this thing that I would never actually do in real life? <laughs> and there have been times where I just thought, what if I just drove? It's more like in a parking garage where they want to charge me like $40 to park for an hour downtown or something. Yeah. And I'm just like, this is highway robbery. But the idea, the fantasy of driving through that arm. Yeah, is... just just right through it. Oh, just wow. right through it. <laughs> That's a good feeling. That's like a good thought. Cynthia in Mission Impossible. That's right. <laughs> the, the Cynthia identity. <laughs> that has a good ring to it. I like it. I like it. Smashing gated community arms everywhere. <laughs> I love it. Jennifer was described as a creature of habit. Which means that if someone had been watching her, they would know her routine, right? Yeah. I remember my dad telling me when I started driving, do not drive home the same way every time. Because if someone is watching you, they will know where you are going to be. Don't be an easy target. That's good advice. Actually, we just in our January Patreon case talked about Cynthia Anderson, right? Yes. H- who had a potential stalker. Yeah. So you don't want to like let people know your routine, right? That's exactly right. But according to Jennifer's family, despite enjoying a routine, Jennifer would not have been an easy target. She was incredibly safety minded. She never went anywhere without telling someone where she was going. She was always aware of her surroundings. She took every precaution. So it seems to me like if she was being watched, she would be the type of person who may have noticed that. Okay. Now, one of the things that does throw a wrench in the idea of some random person watching her and abducting her was the fact that she'd just been out of town on vacation. And while she was gone, her brother and a couple of his friends, including her ex-boyfriend, Matt, stayed at her condo while she was gone. So while she's on that trip with Rob... She's got these guys, single guys, staying at her condo. Okay. Now, I've been interested in criminal profiling for as long as I can remember. I was reading about serial killers and rapists way before I should have been. Let me tell you. (laughs) I'm sure it did something to my developing brain. But one of the things that I have read and, you know, do know is that a stalker type person will be thrown off by a change in routine. Sure. Sure. I think I mentioned this in our other Patreon episode about Jody Hoosentrude. Yeah. She went missing under a set of circumstances similar to Jennifer's. And because she was a TV personality, a lot of people thought she had a stalker. But she had also broken from her normal routine that morning. She was running late. So a lot of people think that would have scared a stalker off. So funny. I almost brought up Jody Hoosentrude because of... The way, like she was leaving in the morning and it appears she was abducted as she was trying to get in her car, which could have been a very similar situation here. Yes. Yes. Where they were abducted more than likely on their way to get in the car to go to work. Yes, absolutely. So as this stalker theory relates to Jennifer, if someone had been watching her with the intent of abducting her, but they'd seen these men coming and going out of her place, that could potentially scare sure. them. And again, Jennifer went missing almost immediately after she got back into town. She spent one night in her condo if she even was there that night because she may have gotten abducted that very night. So I don't know. I think if I were a stalker planning on abducting someone and I saw these guys coming and going, that would like freak me out. Yeah, sure. So after looking at lovers, family members, laborers, authorities turned their attention to Jennifer's co-workers. But the only thing that really turned up there was it was discovered that one of the managers at her office had wanted to date Jennifer but that she'd refused him saying she didn't date people she worked with. That man was interviewed by police more than once, but he was eventually ruled out as a suspect. Now, unfortunately, human trafficking is something that happens here in Central Florida, with Orlando having a higher than average incidence of human trafficking. So that theory has always been talked about as a possibility in Jennifer's case. It's not been completely ruled out, but it's also not considered to be super likely. And I don't know what has brought them to come to that conclusion. But that's where that landed. It's possible, but not likely. In May of 2007, Drew Kessie's company offered a $1 million reward for information leading to Jennifer. But the stipulation was that the tip had to be received by July 4th of that year. Yeah. And Jennifer had to be alive. Unfortunately, that reward was never claimed. I think putting the stipulation she has to be alive, whoever's the informant can't help that. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, Yeah. I guess maybe he was hoping... Of course he's hoping that she'd be alive but and that, wouldn't you want to know either way right but don't like kill her so, yeah like you'll get the money if if she's alive oh i see so don't kill her 
yeah. kind of thing. Like return her. Like if she is alive, that would be enough motive to make you want to return her. Okay, fine. I, Safely. Okay, I see that. Yeah, I see that. A $5,000 reward for information leading to her remains okay. was made available through Central Florida Crime crime line but you know the million dollars was for her to be returned by yeah. july alive on may 2nd 2008 so the following year the florida house of representatives unanimously passed senate bill 502 which is called the jennifer kessie and tiffany sessions missing persons act and this bill reforms how missing persons cases are handled in florida Specifically, this act directs law enforcement officers to start looking for a missing person who is 25 years old or younger within two hours of his or her reported disappearance. Wow. This law applies to those suspected of being in danger yeah. or the victims of a crime. So that's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Because prior to that, it was just minors. Right. You know? Right. Some real good came out of that. Unfortunately, you and I are out. We are out. We are just, <laughs> we're what is it, 48 out. hours? She probably just went for a drive. We're, we're out. Yeah, like, we're long gone. <laughs> we're like the lost colony of Roanoke. We really are. <laughs> Who lost. knows about them? 200 years later. Hey, no. weren't, there, weren't there a couple moms somewhere that went out for milk and never came back? I'm sure they're fine. <laughs> I'm sad to say that more years went by and really we have a whole lot of nothing. So in July of 2010, the FBI took over the case and Jennifer is now on the FBI's most wanted slash missing list. Okay. Now, Jennifer's case has often been linked to the disappearance of another woman, Tara Grinstead. Have you heard of her? No. There are some similarities between the two women. Tara lived in a town in Georgia, but it's only a few hours away from Central Florida. Okay. And both women were young, professional women living alone. Both were seemingly abducted from their complexes with no overt signs of struggle. So this has led many people to wonder if both Jennifer and Tara were victims of a serial killer. Mm. I'm actually going to research Tara's case because I just did like a quick little look into it to see, you know, what similarities I could find with Jennifer. And it looks like there's a lot of interesting stuff there. So I'm going to do that and cover it on an upcoming episode. So I'll be able to tell you my opinion on whether they could be related. There's really no leads. There's there's really no leads that I've heard that, that nobody has come out and said, this is what we think happened. They don't even have a suspect. They have a person of interest who was seen driving that vehicle. Who they can't even say is a man or a woman. It's so wild. There's really nothing on this case, which is why we're, you know, still talking about it. And like nothing's changed. How quickly did that car show up in the surveillance footage? Like what time? So she went missing sometime between Monday night at 10 when she got off the phone yeah. with Rob. And all we know is she never made it to work. Okay. And that car showed up Tuesday at a, like 11 in that complex, but it wasn't reported until, you know, the report of her being missing had been showing for a while and a neighbor saw it and reported it, but it actually showed up like at around 11 a.m. I think it's reasonable to think she slept the night in her apartment or her condo, woke up, got ready for work, was walking out to her car and something happened to her. And by 11 o'clock that morning, that car was dumped. I mean, that's wild, right? Mm -hmm. Just a matter of hours. Just a matter of hours. Yes. And her remains have never been found. Her Like, nothing. Well, no. Her remains have not ever been found. Nothing Wow. of any real consequence has ever come to light Wow. regarding Jennifer. Even in regards to Tara's case, we don't know what serial killer. Just maybe a serial killer. You're just gone. Right. Authorities have never linked these two cases, but if you do any research at all on Jennifer Kessie, you're going to see this case pop up because a lot of people think- So a little okay, armchair sleuths. Right. Because they went missing r around the same time, a couple hours apart. They both kind of fit similar profiles. Okay. But I think it's more of just one of those like rumors that kind of surrounds the case. Yeah. Drew Kessie has continued searching for his daughter and he is really leading the charge on her case as, as a father would. Yeah. 
He went so far as to sue the Orlando Police Department to get the records because, again, it was an open case, technically, so he couldn't get the records. So he had to sue them to get the records. And when he did, he had his team because he has assembled a team now and he had his team comb through the thousands of pages. Yeah. And that's when he learned that there was a piece of DNA collected from that car. Remember I told you that he had never been told about? The fiber. The fiber. And he and his team saw possible signs of a struggle on the hood of Jennifer's car because her car had been covered in dust from the construction. Yeah. Okay. And I guess there was a disturbance okay. in the dust okay. on the hood of her car. And so his team thought maybe this could be a yeah. sign of struggle. Neither of those things were told to him by the authorities this was information he had to gather himself after he had to sue to get okay to get the files 13 years after jennifer's disappearance drew held a press conference because now he's like he's just going to handle this yeah so he held a press conference asking anyone who had ever submitted a tip in jennifer's case to resubmit the tip directly to his team and a very interesting but again he's the reason that we know jennifer's face Right. You know, that the, you and I are so familiar with this because of him. Right. He's billboards and fla- yes. like he has really been leading the yes. charge to find his daughter. So after he asked for these tips to come in, a very interesting tip did come in. A woman who lived on Lake Fisher. I don't know if you're familiar with Lake Fisher or not, but it's a 27 acre lake, 13.3 miles from Jennifer's complex. OK, so it's in Gotha. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this was within a reasonable dumping area, for lack of a better word. Yeah, unfortunately. But yes. Okay. Because it's more of a like rural. There's a lot of uh, orange groves and things out in that area. But it's also very close to Orlando. It's easy easy to get to, but it would be, yeah, a lot more ponds and lakes and orange groves. So a woman who lived on Lake Fisher said that 13 years prior, she had seen what appeared to be a man dump a rolled up carpet into the lake. This was across the lake from her house. Yeah. Where she saw this. But it scared her so much that she hid. Whoa. Because what this person was doing seemed so unusual to her and scary that she was afraid he was up to no good and that he would see her. She did not want to be seen as a witness. Okay. So she hid so this person could not see her. She reported this to the police at the time. But to her knowledge, nothing ever came of it. But when she saw Drew's press conference, she called it into his team. Yeah. Now, this is interesting to me because it's a rolled up carpet. My gut has always told me that probably what happened with Jennifer goes back to the construction workers, the laborers, for several reasons. One, the person on the surveillance tape does appear to be wearing Like a painter's type outfit. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I talked about how it may not be what it looks like, but Mm -hmm. that is what it looks like. Mm -hmm. The fact that they had access, the fact that they could have potentially been watching her day in and day out. Some even made advances to her with those cat calls. Sure. She was alone. They knew she was alone. And there's a potential for, again, if we've talked about more transient workers and things with that, a lot of, lot of roots in the area. Absolutely. So my gut has always told me that's probably who is responsible. Somebody working on that site. When that reporter, I told you that reporter who showed up and talked about the security at the complex. When she showed up that morning that Jennifer went missing, the thing she noticed was a bunch of like construction type vans and trucks and many, many rolls of carpet sticking out of them yeah. because again they're laying carpet they're replacing carpet so the fact that there's a rolled up carpet being dumped into the water at the same time could mean nothing but to me we have two different people now saying rolls of carpet which would be a perfect place to hide a body quite frankly and it would not be unusual to see a roll of carpet being carried off the property onto the property you know what I mean? Like, that's a place where you could hide a body. Well, and somebody throwing a roll of carpet into a lake is unusual. Okay. That's the other thing. I Like, that is not something that's uh, that you're going to see. Well, and I was racking my brain. Is there is there any reason, is there any good reason why I would throw a roll of carpet into a lake? 
I don't know if you don't want to pay because that would probably be like a bulk item if you don't want to pay extra to have it picked up because I imagine in that area, you know, it's a little bit more high end. I don't know. Well, I'm trying to think of all the non nefarious reasons you would want to dispose of a roll of carpet that way. Mm -hmm. And that's all I can think really is it, it would be a bulk pickup. You don't want it in front of your house. You don't have to pay for extra surcharges. You don't have to drive it to the dump. But it does seem very strange right. that that would happen. It's funny you say that because I literally was racking my brain. Why would I why would I throw a rolled up carpet in the lake? And the only thing I could think of is, OK, well, my trash pickup wouldn't take it, which yep. means my husband would have to drive it to the dump yep. and we would have to pay yes. to have it disposed. That's exactly of. right. Yep. So I thought, I guess if I didn't want to pay the however much money to have it disposed of, I might throw it in a lake. But other than that. I have no idea why it would be no, thrown in your the idea is my idea. That's the only reason I can think of. Okay. So it's a valid reason, though, because we both came up with it independently. So yes. Maybe they just were trying to avoid the charges. Yeah. Either way, Drew did not waste any time getting experts out to this lake, right? So they started with two cadaver dogs, and both dogs, Chance and Draco, hit on the exact same spot separately. So they were brought out okay. separately. This spot was exactly where this witness had said she saw the carpet being dumped. Oh. So after signaling the way the dogs were trained to do, whatever that is, sitting yes. down or however, both of them then charged towards the water as if whatever they were picking up on was, was in, in the water. The water. Mm -hmm. So this was enough to get approval for a dive team to go into the water. But after a full day's search, no remains were found in Lake Fisher. Hmm. Now it's a 27 acre lake, which sounds like a lot. At the same time, acres are not huge. They sound 27 acres sounds like, oh, that's a lot of land, mm -hmm. but it's not really huge. So mm -hmm. it's a, a small lake, medium sized lake. Yeah, it's I not mean, a it's, pond. It's but not it's, a pond. It's bigger than a pond. Right. But it's but, not like a great lake, which no. would be impossible to properly no. search. No. I don't know how long, from what I understand, there were like two men or two people with like, each person has a rope and then a diver would like just follow mm -hmm. that rope to just make sure that every yeah. bit was. Listen, I'm sure if, if Drew Kessie was on it, it was searched. Yes. Is my feeling. Well, sure. Yeah. And if you're going to go to those lengths to bring in cadaver dogs and bring in a dive team, I mean, we might as well just do it thoroughly while we're here. Sure. But unfortunately, it was it was pretty disheartening because nothing was found yeah and even though at this point of course nobody wants to find they the didn't remains even of find, their daughter they didn't even find the carpet not that i heard no they, they oh, didn't weird. even find the carpet now it was 13 years later so florida's mucky yeah and i will say this lake was uh described as like marshy and mucky and yeah. like you know what i mean it was like a pretty clear blue lake it was yeah like, yeah i understand so would a carpet disintegrate over 13 years yeah a carpet underwater yeah get covered in mud yeah. yeah i would assume so yeah would we expect to find a whole carpet yeah yeah i don't know i got gotcha. you unfortunately that's kind of where i leave you we haven't really had any new tips we don't know any more today than we did back in 2006 as to what may have happened to Jennifer Kessie. Like I said, we don't even have a, a suspect. They don't even have a suspect. They have a person of interest who is sometimes referred to as a suspect who is, you know, on that surveillance tape. I mean, tape, that surveillance but, tape is so infuriating. It's really, really upsetting because it is the one thing that could potentially change the case. Now, is it possible that whoever was involved because I definitely believe Jennifer met with foul play. So is it possible that whoever met or whoever was involved or responsible for Jennifer's disappearance was not the person driving that vehicle? Sure. Th like we said, it's not downtown Orlando, but it's a busy area. If there was a car just, you know, easily available, is it possible that somebody else took it and then dumped it? I mean, within those short amount of hours, I would not find that likely, okay. in my opinion. The person driving it wasn't necessarily the person that abducted Jennifer, but I think they at least know the person. Okay. So like, hey, Stephanie, can you pick up my car and just drop it off and yeah. come back? Like, or hey, my friend's car, would you mind dropping it off? You know what I'm saying? Right. I think they would at least know the person. That makes sense. And 
he, so here's here's the big question with that. If they aren't the person involved, they still haven't come forward. But there could be a whole multitude of reasons. Either they're undocumented and so they don't yeah. want to come forward because they're afraid of, you know, other repercussions. Yeah. Or because now they think, oh my gosh, like I'm involved in this girl's yeah. disappearance. Yeah. I don't know. But that's that's the best that's the best tip we have. And it's awful. It sucks. Like there's nothing. We don't even know if it's a man or a woman. My gut has always gone to someone working on that site. That's that's probably the most likely scenario. But we don't, like I said, we don't even know who those people are. We don't. Right. And more than likely, I mean, transient. That area is big on tourism. Lots of tourists in that yes. area. So lots of transient people. So finding out who was driving that vehicle is got to be number one. And to be honest, I don't know that we'll ever truly find it. I mean, I don't know what more we can do. The fact that they haven't come forward at this point is probably unlikely, but that would create a lot of momentum in the case. It would. It absolutely would. It absolutely would. And growing up here in Central Florida, I mean, we were adults when this happened, but she's one of our faces. Like she's one of the faces that we see all the time. If you've visited Central Florida, it's very likely you've seen her face somewhere. So if you know anything. Yes, absolutely. Please. And that would be to contact the Orlando Police Department. Orlando Police Department. At this point, the FBI actually is, has taken over lead investigation on the case. She's one of their top missing people. So, wow. Friends, we just passed the 18th anniversary of Jennifer Kessie's disappearance. I encourage you to stop and take a minute, send a prayer or a well wish or whatever it is you do to Jennifer's family and friends, as I'm sure they are feeling that pain as if it happened yesterday, feeling it all over again. But we want to leave you on a happy note. Stephanie, why don't you tell us a little bit about the Jennifer Kessie Criminal Justice Endowed Scholarship for our Branch of Hope? Well, what an honor. (laughs) We have two great nonprofit organizations that we are representing in the month of February. The National Trust for Historic Preservation, which we covered in the 16th Street bombing episode, which is going to really help solidify a lot of those cornerstones in American history. And And as Cynthia mentioned, we also have the Jennifer Kessie Criminal Justice Endowed Scholarship available at the University of Central Florida right here in Orlando. Again, this episode just feels so personal, right? It's so personal. And UCF is where Jennifer attended. So it's amazing that they were able to host the scholarship. This honestly feels very kismet because we reached out to UCF, told them what we were going to do. And they were so enthusiastic, not only about this episode, being able to work together to bring awareness to Jennifer Kessie's case, but also to their scholarship and the good work that they're doing in the criminal justice system. Drew Kessie believed very much in first responders and knows that in missing persons cases, it really is those first few hours that make the biggest difference. So he set up this Jennifer Kessie Criminal Justice Endowed Scholarship, which provides $1,000 per student that qualifies for this scholarship at the University of Central Florida. And what's incredible too, of course, you have to have a certain amount of academic requirements in order to apply for the scholarship. But applicants are also encouraged to write their own view on the Jennifer Kessie Tiffany Sessions Missing Persons Act of 2008 that we talked about. That's so cool. It really is cool. This really comes full circle and so encouraging for students to realize how this all came about. Because again, as you mentioned, this is the 18th year anniversary. So a lot of these students applying for the scholarship quite honestly, may not have even been (laughs) alive when Jennifer disappeared. And again, it's another way to keep her memory around and to encourage those to help missing persons like Jennifer. Absolutely. And big shout out to UCF because they actually rank number 12 in the country in their criminal justice program. So they have a really great criminal justice program. So this is a great place to go to pursue that type of career. And again, I cannot understate 
how wonderful their team has been so far working with us, giving us more information about the scholarship and encouraging more people to understand what a difference this can make in the lives of, of families who have had you know missing persons in their family. So a wonderful not-for-profit organization. Uh, both of them, I'm so thrilled with our options this month of February. Me too. I feel like our options just keep getting better. So good. So good. Yeah. Lots of good going back out to the community. The Dark Oak gives a portion of our proceeds from our Patreon and from our sponsors. And you as individuals can also donate through the Dark Oak, or you can go directly to these organizations if you feel led to do so and donate in uh, Jennifer's honor to help these students and also for the 16th Street bombing, if that's something that kind of pulls at your heartstrings. We encourage you to go above and beyond. That's what we're all about on this podcast. We just want to do good things. We want to put good things out to the world. If you don't have any extra funds this month, that's okay. All you have to do is tell us where you want our funds to go. That's right. We make it really easy for you. You get to help give back. Yeah. And we love that. We love kind of being the mouthpiece for you. It what feels do you really good. Do? It feels really good. And we want to encourage you. You can reach out to us on our email and let us know if you have an amazing case linked to a not-for-profit that you would like us to support. We would love to do that. We want to bring awareness to these other people doing amazing things, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Takes yeah. A, it takes a whole community. It takes a whole community. Absolutely. Cynthia, do you want to tell our listeners about our Patreon? Our Patreon, guys, we are really excited. We have three different tiers. Depending upon what tier you choose will determine what kind of swag and perks you might get. The top tier, you get a monthly live with Stephanie and I. So you're right there live talking to us. Uh, There's some swag. For the top two tiers, there's an extra bonus episode every month, uh, and there's some good ones up there. They're really good, guys. You get a double vote for the Branch of Hope Fund as to where those those funds are going to go. So there's lots of exciting things over there. Plus, it's a way to get to know us a little more personally. We're able to share a little more about ourselves also. So that's Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com. And once you're at Patreon.com, you can just search for The Dark Oak. And it's pretty self-explanatory from there. And make sure to catch us anywhere you listen to podcasts. We also have a YouTube channel. You could subscribe there if that's easier for you to listen kind of on the go or at work. We found a lot of listeners really enjoy catching us there. Please send us an email at the dark oak podcast at gmail.com. We are open to your questions, comments, and anything else you want to share. For other ways to connect, hop over to the darkoak.com and be sure to follow us to our next episode where we cover the insane story of D.B. Cooper. What happened to that guy? Oh, Stephanie's going to tell us all about it. I am where is so the mo- excited. Where is the money? <laughs> Where is D.B. Cooper? Where is D.B. Cooper? Where is the money? I, I feel like like the 16th Street bombing and the disappearance of Jennifer Kessie, they're just a heavy cases. And I'm really excited to talk about D.B. Cooper. It's going to be a nice lift for us. But what a mystery. Such a mystery. And I hate to say this because it's probably not very, I don't know, it's not the right thing for me to say because <laughs> I know he was a criminal. But there's this part of me that really hopes he got away with it. <laughs> How did I know you would say that? (laughs) Cynthia with the macabre and the criminal over there. (laughs) He didn't hurt anybody. So, you know. It's true. Uh, Yeah. It's going to be, it's going to be a really fun one for us. I'm excited. Yeah. Come back guys. Thank you so much for listening to us and supporting us. Um, We love you, Shiver Seekers. We sure do. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. This episode of The Dark Oak was created, researched, written, recorded, hosted, edited, published, and marketed by Cynthia and Stephanie of Just Us Gals Productions and made possible by you, our shiver-seeking listener. Special thanks goes to Justice Himes for our incredible artwork and Ryan Crete for our amazing music.